Ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, I will start uh, with a concrete question. We don't need to uh, introduce our special guests. And of course, it's difficult not to talk about the war in Ukraine. So although uh, we are mainly in going to discuss NATO summit and NATO's new strategy, how NATO is adapting to, to this new security environment that we have now. I would like to ask you, Madam Ambassador, with um, how uh, the war um, influenced American threat perception and uh, what is the, the U.S. end state, the, the goal of the U.S. of the Biden's administration regarding the war in Ukraine? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's lovely to be back in Warsaw and uh, to have this opportunity uh, to engage. Uh, I engage all the time with Tomas uh, at NATO, but wonderful to see so many friends here in Warsaw and engage in a conversation not only about Ukraine, but about the Madrid summit. So looking forward to that. Um, on, the, on the question of threat perception, I mean, I think fundamentally we all agree at NATO back in Washington that what happened on February 24th was just a transformative watershed moment um, that fundamentally upended the European security order, and that this has broken down many assumptions that we had about peace and stability on the European continent. Many of us assumed we would not see a major land war in Europe uh, in the year 2022. Obviously, Russia's aggression has had a lasting impact on our discussion inside the NATO alliance. It's had a lasting impact on threat perceptions, on our assessment of the Russian threat. And we've learned some lessons. We've learned some lessons about how Putin doesn't always attach intent to capability. He has not had the capacity to take over all of Ukraine, as he intended in those early days. But he still had the intent and the will and the desire to do it. And he did it anyways. So we've learned some hard lessons here about Russia recklessness, um, but we've also learned some wonderful lessons about NATO unity and what allies like Poland have been willing and able to do in this crisis. And I've been nothing short of astounded of what Poland in particular has stepped up to do in this moment in NATO for Ukrainians, for Ukrainians in Ukraine, for Ukrainians here in Poland, at the OSCE, at the UN, I could go on and on and on. In terms of the end state and what we hope to see at the end, I mean, obviously, Obviously, we want to see and we believe we will see Ukraine prevail. And we want them to protect their territorial integrity and, and their sovereignty. We want to see Ukraine remain a thriving democracy. We want to remain committed to see the alliance stay united in this moment, not just in this moment, but over the long term. We've seen an enormous amount of unity across the NATO alliance, which has also been uh, remarkable. We want to see a strategic defeat uh, for Russia. We want Russia to leave Ukraine. We want Russia to stop the violence, stop these indiscriminate, brutal attacks on civilians. So we all, I think, share those goals, where we want this, this war to end and why we want it to end. And we will continue to work tirelessly together, both Poland and the United States, and with all NATO allies, to try and reach those objectives. Thank you very much. Strategic defeat, and we want, of course, um, to uh, see Ukraine as an independent sovereign state in its uh, internationally recognized borders. Um, but how um, likely it is that it will happen in the coming months and years, it's difficult to say. But definitely NATO has a significant role to play uh, here. I would like to ask Mr. Ambassador about, uh, about this. How does it look from, uh, you are in Brussels, but uh, you have the Polish perspective. From the Polish perspective, um, what is or should be NATO's role during this, uh, this conflict? There are some expectations, you know, people ask why we cannot introduce no-fly zone, for example, over Ukraine. What is the major NATO's role here? Yeah, thank you. Uh, before I start, let me say I'm very honored to be uh, part of this conference, and I'm very honored to be here with my great colleague, uh, Julie, uh, who is the, a very strong and uh, voice at the, at the NAC and, and, and uh, does represent the U.S. leadership uh, very competently. And, 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 and in a, with a great uh, class. Uh, 
Um, let me say that before uh, we give the picture of what NATO can do and what NATO is doing, I mean, we're not start starting from the scratch. For years since 2014, in particular, NATO has been providing a lot of assistance through training, through uh, comprehensive assistance uh, package, uh, and, and so have allies. And it's also important to make this uh, difference or, or sort of to shed li light on this confusion. Sometimes we speak about NATO, sometimes we, we, we speak about allies. We sometimes make deliberate choices to leave certain activities for allies. However, they are they sort of um, reinforce one uh, another. And in this context, for instance, the, the allies present under NATO flag or in bilateral um, arrangements have also helped us and others to help Ukraine more, uh, to help uh, Ukraine in a, in a better uh, way to be secure um, uh, whilst providing assistance to, uh, to Ukraine. So division between those is not, is not uh, always um, um, sharp. Um, then, uh, indeed, allies have made uh, a political choice for the alliance not to be the major vehicle of, of providing assistance to Ukraine. This is primarily uh, in order not to fall into Putin's uh, narrative. I mean, P Putin actually wants NATO, wants to portray this conflict as a conflict of Russia against NATO, which tries to encycle uh, um, uh, the holy land of, of, of Russia. So uh, we, we didn't want to give the, him this opportunity to mobilize his, uh, his public through that. However, indeed, Poland belongs to the, the, those allies that think there are roles for NATO uh, and NATO perhaps could play uh, an even more ambitious uh, role in this conflict beyond shielding uh, allies. Uh, which, uh, as I was trying to mention, has been uh, very critical. Uh, and, and we are working, I, I can only say, we are working tirelessly together with Julie uh, f to find those uh, areas. Uh, for instance, there could be different vehicles, comprehensive assistance uh, package, long-term long needs, training opportunities, providing non lethal equipment, which uh, is not such a benign thing. I mean, there's, for instance, engineering equipment that could be provided to, to Ukraine. So there, there's more to come. There's more to come, and uh, this picture is, uh, is uh, very good anyway. Thank you. It is very important to, uh, to underline what you said, Mr. Ambassador, that there is no clear-cut line between NATO's collective defense and strengthening the sense of security of the allies and what they can do, you know, um, to stabilize security outside NATO's territory, right? Because a sense of security is absolutely necessary for them to be determined to have the political will to, to provide assistance and to calculate, calculate risk. At the same time, we could see uh, when we uh, analyze it very closely, uh, when we analyze the NATO's assistance per se, for Ukraine, it's, it seems rather limited comparing to assistance offered on bilateral terms. Like bilateral American assistance to, to Ukraine is huge. Yeah, you, you wanted to add something yeah. to it. Uh, again, I just want to say, I mean, but NATO is allies, first of all, and then there's been major step recently, this Rammstein group that was established under US leadership at the Rammstein base uh, is going to be primary v vehicle. It also uh, encompasses more um, nations than, than that are represented within the alliance. But again, there's going to be some synergies between the alliances and other vehicles of support mm -hmm. for Ukraine. Coming back to the first uh, uh, opening question, uh, there are still pretty influential voices in the United States uh, advocating for the United States to focus on Indo-Pacific. How, how does this war in Ukraine influence this uh, debate? And, and, and is it a, a real dilemma for the global power, as the United States is, that you will have to choose between Indo-Pacific and, and Europe? Uh, or maybe the United States is able to do both theaters at the same time to offer not only reassurance but credible defense and deterrence in both regions. 
Well, I don't, I don't think that folks uh, back in Washington would describe it as a dilemma. I think the perspective back home is that we can address both of these challenges and threats. The immediate challenge and where we spend most of our time right now is obviously on Ukraine and, and the war that, that's ongoing and always calculating what more we can do and how we can assist Ukrainian forces, but also how we can provide additional humanitarian and economic assistance. So that is the central focus. There's just no question. But at the same time, the government is quite large. We're able to, in an old uh, American phrase, walk and chew gum at the same time. We saw yesterday the president get on a plane and travel to Asia, uh, which will be an important part of our policy, reaching out to allies across the, the Pacific, working with the, the Japanese and the South Koreans. But it's interesting. We've also, at NATO, started to bridge the divide as well. For the first time in NATO's history, we've had our first foreign ministerial with four Asian Pacific countries at the table. So we had Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, and South Korea all join us in a NATO session. I think that also shows that the world is in some ways getting smaller, and that some of these conversations start to run together. Australia, for example, is providing a tremendous amount of support to Ukraine. We talk to our friends in the Asia Pacific about Ukraine, and we also talk about our friends at NATO, we talk to our friends at NATO about the Asia Pacific. One interesting thing that's gonna change in the coming weeks is NATO is going to release a new strategic concept, as everyone in the room knows, last updated in 2010. That strategic concept didn't mention China. This one will, quite deliberately and for good reason. In part, not only because we believe that now the NATO alliance has to turn to what China is doing in and around the Euro-Atlantic area, but we also believe that the alliance has to be attuned to the strategic alignment that we now find between Russia and China. The fact that China is parroting very much the language that Russia uses on Ukraine, and they've now talked about this no limits partnership. They've both commented on NATO enlargement, and for those reasons, we believe that the alliance has to simultaneously focus on Obviously, issue number one, the war in Ukraine, but also keep an eye on the evolving China-Russia partnership and the Asia-Pacific. Yeah, so if, if I can ask a follow-up question to, to this, this is fascinating, and a lot of people are worried, especially those who do not follow NATO on a daily basis, even if they have general knowledge, they probably heard about, you know, the Article 5, they may know that it is limited to, you know, geographically to the Euro-Atlantic area, and when they hear that there will be China mentioned in NATO's strategic concept, they, they are worried that, oh, God, NATO is just like, it will be overextended, it will have to deal both with Russia and China. How, how would you address those um, those concerns? Well, it's, it's important to do a little bit of myth-busting in that regard, and I think no one is suggesting that NATO take its naval forces and suddenly sign off, you know, sail off into the South China Sea. I think what we're talking about is for the alliance, again, to have deeper, more substantive conversations about what the China-Russia alignment means for our collective security and what China's activities in Europe and most importantly its investments in Europe could potentially mean for our security. China is increasingly picking up little bits of investments in critical infrastructure that at face value sometimes is benign, sometimes it's not. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, how can some of those investments and relationships that China's developing in Europe or around Europe, will that create any sort of added vulnerabilities for us? How can we build resilience? How can we be smart about Chinese investments? And how can NATO be attuned, again, to some of the risks in this China-Russia alignment. That's really what we're talking about. Yeah, and we also need to remember that some threats do not have geographical borders, right, in cyberspace or in outer space. And we also have this NATO doctrine that, you know, in cyberspace, uh, Article 5 also applies. So if China launches a massive cyber attack against any ally, the Article 5 
could be used. Yeah, and I would add in the strategic concept, you will see emphasis on those, uh, those two new domains of cyber and space, and you're right, to your point, that's where the geographical borders really aren't relevant, that we need first and foremost partners around the world to work on strengthening our cyber capabilities, also to learn from those partners, but we also have to understand how we can develop new tools and policies to cope with some of the challenges in those domains like space and cyber. But from the Polish perspective and regional perspective, it should be a priority to draw NATO back to its roots, right? To, to stress that collective defense and uh, the primary mission on the Euro-Atlantic area is the most important. And from collective defense, we go to defense and deterrence uh, policy. How would you, Mr. Ambassador, expect that new strategy addresses this uh, issue, that it opens uh, the, the, the way for further adaptation of, of defense and deterrence mission, how we should think about NATO's force and command's posture in the coming years. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, this, is, this is our priority um, uh, on the run in the run to the summit, but it's been also happening uh, on our eyes for a number of years right now. And I would also like to shift our attention away from just posture and some elements of the posture, like, like forward positioning uh, troops, because this is a much larger uh, issue. But before I go on and say why and what, uh, I mean, be before I go on and say what, I, I will say why. I mean, first of all, this crisis in Ukraine has shown that Russia is willing to use force to break international law and is willing to do that in a really barbaric manner. I mean, when you look, I mean, I sometimes draw some history conclusions that may be controversial, but when you actually look at the first half of the Second World War, there's nothing that Third World, uh, Third Reich has done that Russia wouldn't have uh, ever done so far in, in terms of like the behavior towards civilians, uh, resettling population. Um, I would say even in terms of the sexual violence that, that they've sort of, uh, surpassed the standards of the first um, uh, part of the Second World War. So it's really a horrific picture that, that, that we're seeing in the, uh, in the East, and we have to recognize that, that we have to make provisions for the security of the Alliance, and we have to discourage any uh, notion that there might be opportunity uh, for some accomplished um, uh, acts, uh, that might be an opportunity to compensate the strategic failure that we are seeing uh, in Ukraine and divert uh, the attention of the Russian uh, public. I, I also want to acknowledge that there are voices uh, in the, within the alliance that they are, that, 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 that they are uh, stating, well, Ukraine has proven to basically be able to defend its uh, integrity, uh, defend, defend its sovereignty. It's going to be a, man a factor that will influence our strategic um, balance in this, of course, this is undeniable. We are uh, looking forward to the accession of Sweden and Finland, which is also going to be another positive factor influencing the balance uh, of force in the in the East. And maybe in that context, we don't have to change that much. But I want to say that, first of all, I mean, in terms of the outcome of the crisis in, uh, of the war in Ukraine, uh, we may have uh, over estimated Russians, but I, I, would, I would rather attribute the, the surprise to, to our underestimation of, of Ukrainians. They have been much more competent than we, than we were willing to, to, to recognize. Second is that the operational statement that we're seeing uh, in, in Ukraine right now actually proves that it is possible to stop the aggression at the borders. Um, uh, uh, lastly, we have to impose strategic cost on Russia. Russia cannot emerge fr from this crisis in a comfortable strategic um, uh, situation. So, um, and, 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 and here it is what we should do basically and what we have been doing so far. Because let me say, till more or less 2018, the, since the beginning of the 90s, in the military strategic terms, the alliance has been an ad hoc alliance. So there was no military strategy since 1991. And then when there was a crisis, the Allies would gather, they would define the strategic obje objective, then they, they would define course of action, develop planning, generate forces. This has been an expeditionary 
paradigm. Exposition paradigm because we were focused mostly on out of area, but there was an exposition paradigm, I would argue, also in terms of the defense of the, of the uh, frontiers of the alliance. We've assumed the um, world has been more or less benign, Russians have been incapable of an uh, aggressive action, so the, the allies would be able to react to generate forces and to and, and to uh, and to move them uh, into the uh, area of the crisis. I mean, we have to move away from that paradigm into the paradigm of the deterrence and defense by denial, which includes harnessing national home defense forces. And here, I, I would s like to encourage us. I mean, here Poland to be a little bit less modest. I think, in terms of the numbers, the most significant decisions in terms of strengthening of the East will be taken in Warsaw as a consequence of the National Home Defense uh, Act, which will uh, lead to 3% being, being of the being the floor of the of the defense um, uh, spending, a lot of uh, lots of major acquisition and force development decision uh, decision follow, following up. And of course, we look forward to more robust um, uh, forward um, uh, defense as a result of decisions taken uh, in in Madrid, moving away from the tripwire uh, logic to a kind of. Um, but this is going to be an element of the overall um, posture. Uh, this is going to be part of uh, a reform of uh, force uh, planning and operational planning, which has to recognize that we need to um, be able uh, and we need to prepare to defend our, our, uh, every inch of our alliance territory. We, uh, what you know concerns me uh, that in the previous uh, strategy, which was definitely first of all based on mainly on the ability of sending the reinforcements, we had the forward enhanced forward presence, um, significant, and of course the multinational uh, groups and uh, the, the members of those groups were usually the most important and strongest allies, which sent a clear signal that NATO would be involved from the very first day. But as you, as you said, we have to be able to defend the territory from the very first day and after Bucha. For a lot of people, um, it may be a major concern whether if we still continue with the strategy, it's always been like this, I know. Even during the Cold War, it was based on the, on the reinforcements. But um, we probably will have a bigger force closer to the, to the borders. And as you rightly say, the ma major burden will be on the shoulders of the nation states. Um, uh, uh, just Poland as the biggest state here in the region will have a greatest role to play. But shall we expect a bigger um, forward presence, forward defense on the NATO side? Uh, can we expect that the battle groups will be turned into, uh, not, uh, will not be based on the battalions, but on a bit larger formations, units? I would argue, first of all, that we are witnessing already a much uh, more robust presence uh, as we sit and discuss here. I mean, we're uh, having uh, around 10, more than 10,000 US troops right now in Poland. Uh, our sky has been defended uh, and we sometimes fail to recognize that we have a very land-centric, and, and I argue this is the right approach, but I mean, our skies have been defended in a very effective manner throughout the crisis that has been uh, NATO fighter jets, uh, Polish, but also Dutch, US, uh, French, and so on and so on, patrolling the skies uh, from the very beginning of the of the crisis on a 24/7 basis. And uh, this is something that Russians have definitely noticed that, that that the naval presence has has also been very robust. So, so this is a very good baseline for further decisions. But it's already strengthened. I, I, w I want to I want us to recognize that. There's a, one of those um, you know, paradigms that NATO operated uh, so far was um, enforced by the NATO-Russia Founding Act signed in 1997. And uh, although NATO observed all the commitments in, in, in this act, Russia has violated it dozens, if not hundreds of, of, of time. And what we have to remember also, um, and uh, this is what I would like to, to stress, that all the commitments that we have signed 
uh, subscribed to since the Helsinki final act in 1975. Uh, the major goal was to avoid a large-scale war in Europe, and it was a common interest. We, we created this paradigm on the agreement that it is in no one's interest to have a large-scale war. Even the Soviet Union at that time was pretty afraid of, of a large-scale war, and it wanted to avoid it. And now we can be pretty sure that Russia perceives a large-scale war as an instrument of its policy, that all those commitments are irrelevant. And those commitments uh, were also you know, included in NATO-Russia Funding Act, but thinking that Russia will probably observe those commitments, NATO was ready to impose self limitations on itself regarding the substantial combat presence on um, the territory of the newer uh, NATO states. Uh, what worries me is you know, what signal Russia would get if we would still operate within this framework. If, you know, after Georgia, there were not significant costs imposed on Russia, so Putin calculated that he can go further. After Crimea, limited costs. He calculated, okay, I can go further, then he goes with a full-scale invasion. And then if he sees that NATO still operates in the spirit of NATO-Russia Founding Act, which sends the signal that, okay, we don't deploy substantial combat forces on the territory of newer member states, he may, I would get a clear signal. You know, this region is open for negotiations. Let's start the war with NATO and let's negotiate what I demanded in December by putting on the table the, the proposals of the treaties with NATO and United States. US and NATO should withdraw its forces from, from the region. They would subscribe to some legally binding guarantees that they will not deploy troops to the region. This, this is an encouragement for me. For, for me. Uh, so how, how would you respond to this? What, what should we do with this NATO-Russia founding act? Well, I think, look, Russia's actions on February 24th changed, changed everything. I mean, they are obviously in clear violation of the NATO-Russia founding act. And I think as we've already, as Tomas noted, taken decisions on force posture, Russia is not part of that conversation and doesn't get to veto any of those decisions. And alliance members made decisions rapidly, even before February 24th, to move posture into Eastern Europe. NATO is now undertaking a conversation about its medium and long-term posture with the goal to have some things to announce and discuss at the Madrid, Madrid summit in late June. And as we debate, NATO's medium and longer term posture in the wake of this war in Ukraine, the NATO-Russia Founding Act will not be part of that conversation. We will not be referring to that document. NATO will take decisions, individual allies will take decisions on posture as they see fit. And I think Russia's actions, again, has have fundamentally upset the order and forced us into an entirely different set of conversations. And again, as Tomas noted, there's evidence that that change is underway. And there'll be more to say about that in late June. Mm -hmm. But should we have some kind of an open statement that we do not feel bound by, by, by this um, document, Mr. Ambassador? How, how, do you, how realistic is this? First of all, I, I want to uh, draw our attention back to the statement of the virtual NATO summit from late February, two days after the invasion, when uh, NATO leaders have recognized that Russia have, has walked away from um, um, the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Um, and it also mentions the need to establish some significant presence uh, in the, um, uh, on the NATO, uh, on NATO frontiers, to put it this way. Because uh, there, are two, there are two important uh, aspects of the NATO-Russia Founding Act. One, one is the framework to engage with Russia. And I mean, our position is basically we cannot have a, we cannot assume that by default, R NATO, uh, whatever Russia does, Russia is NATO's partner. I mean, this cannot be, uh, I mean, not R Russia cannot be war rewarded for actions like in, in, in Ukraine. Second is that, I mean, there's nothing wrong, wrong about c confidence security building measures. There's nothing wrong, to, wrong about agreeing that we will adjust the po posture not to be escalatory, but in doing so, uh, what, 
especially concerned Poland, was the notion of sort of a second cl class me membership on, or indeed, and kind of implied buffer zone. It was more or less a cost of our acc accession to NATO, which it was done in a, in a very specific uh, strategic environment, but now, as we see, allies have recognized this situation has changed. Russia walked away. There's going to be an ad adjustment of, of, uh, of uh, posture. Now, indeed, the Polish position is that NATO-Russia founding act uh, is null and void, and that um, basically we shouldn't be bound by, by an act that has been breached more than a dozen of times by, by, by the other party. But, I mean, whether we still have an act or not is more of a theological debate if we assume that we agree that we, I mean, that Russia is not a partner by default and that the, the and that we are not confined and constrained by pro provisions of such act in terms of the posture. And you mentioned this uh, notion of a second uh, class member state. It, it, it hasn't been very, you know, politically attractive in, in, in Poland, but it appeared in the past in the, in the public debate. Today, you, to, to those who would say that, you know, there is no NATO, you know, the United States will be in Asia Pacific, France and Germany and UK do not have any potential whatsoever. There is no, the, no alliance and Poland is anyway a second rate member state. How would you respond to those? I would like to wish those people to be present as witnesses at the NAC uh, on the 24th uh, of February uh, at 8 a.m. I think it was, it was very remarkable. I mean, it was the, one of the shortest uh, meetings of the Council. Secretary General was, was really pleased with that. <laughs> and, but, but, I mean, the, uh, whatever debates we have had, whatever, you know, in terms of the approach and everything, there, there was a unity and, and there was a, a, a resolve. This is, this is something that marks, I think, that the uh, alliance works and has been represented by, by the measures taken by the, uh, by, the, by the allies. I think that uh, skeptics about the uh, strength uh, of the transatlantic bond are in a much weaker position right now than, were, than they were before the crisis. Before the war, sorry. Yes. And, and if you would wish folks to have joined us, you know, if they had, wishing folks could have seen the unity that we saw on uh, that 8 a.m. emergency NAC on February 24th, I would add another NAC, well, it was the NATO-Russia Council on January 12th, a four-hour meeting with allies in Russia at the table. Russia came in, Grushko repeatedly tried to pick off allies one by one, tried several different tactics, personal attacks, calling out individual countries, seeing if he could wear us down, seeing if they could break down the unity in that moment, trying different subject matters, again, personal insults, whatever it took. And what was remarkable about that four hours was to watch the allies sit there united with a single message message, not ceding any ground, holding to the red lines. We will not talk about NATO's open door policy. We will not allow you to weigh in. We could talk to you in the future about these three areas, risk reduction, arms control, and transparency. That's it. Take it or leave it. And I think they walked away with a, f a very firm set of messages about alliance unity in this moment. I mean, we debate each and every day in the NAC. There are differences of views and opinions, and that's what life in the NAC is all about. But when it counts, when it's those important, crucial, transformative moments, the morning of February 24th, January 12th in the NATO-Russia Council, unity is there in spades, and there's not an, just an ounce of daylight among the allies. It was a remarkable moment. And I think that's really where Putin has fundamentally miscalculated. He's enjoyed trying to divide us for so long, and occasionally he finds little wedges to drive here and there. But on this subject, on Ukraine's right to defend itself, on its right to protect its own territorial integrity and sovereignty, the unity is rock solid, and it remains so at the three-month mark, and I'm convinced that it'll stay that way for however long it takes. Not that I needed any reassurance, <laughs> but I feel reassured uh, even more than I was before. So, uh, so we have time for some questions, more than 10 minutes, so let's start with uh, 
my Patricia Sassnal from the first row. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Great conversation. Uh, I'm head of research at PISM. Just a short comment. I wonder whether on the 12th of January and the 24th of February, Turkey w also showed this rock solid unity. All right. Uh, but then my question is about EU-NATO relations. So now we have, what, 23 members of EU in NATO. <coughs> That, I assume, just shows how stronger these uh, relations have become. But I wonder, and this is my question to, to Julie Smith, uh, if you are able to say, given the progress of EU-NATO relations, that the United States welcomes a joint European greater security, or, there is, or you still have second thoughts about it and you're not ready to say this? No, we, we support efforts in NATO, in the European Union, for Europeans to build capacity. And we have always asked for Europeans to continue building capacity. And if that happens occasionally across town in the framework of an EU initiative, or it happens at NATO, that's fundamentally a good thing for the alliance. Obviously, we are a member of the NATO alliance. It's the organization we know best. We believe it plays the most critical role on transatlantic security, but we welcome opportunities, particularly now as both institutions are looking at hybrid tactics and gray zone challenges. We welcome opportunities to work with our European Union partners on things like cyber, where there's competency in both organizations, or resilience, or disinformation, or energy security. So much of what we face as partners really cross is the border between those two organizations. We'll still focus on the conventional defense challenges, the core challenges inside the NATO alliance, but we are open-minded. I think you've seen the, the statement that both President Biden and President Macron issued together last fall on European defense, um, and I think what we've seen is a shift somewhat in, in attitude. We've invested in a new EU-US dialogue on China, where we think we can do good work with the European Union there. Um, and so there are opportunities for us to work together. And you'll see some, some language on that EU-NATO relationship uh, in the strategic concept. Again, it will surface as another part of the, of the concept itself. Tomasz. Uh, Tomasz Smarpolski Foundation. I've got a question concerning uh, the new uh, NATO strategic concept. Uh, as we know, in the report NATO 2030, uh, there were uh, some suggestions concerning that NATO core tasks should be extended. Uh, I don't know, in, uh, for example, including uh, terrorism uh, to, to those tasks. I, I wonder if after after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, still there are like uh, are discussion like that, and the second controversial issue about, uh, about, uh, was about limiting uh, the veto power in uh, North Atlantic Council, increasing the level, level of one country veto to uh, the ministerial level. Uh, so I, I, I wonder if it was like long shot or, or there is something behind and there are, are, are discussions like that during the process of preparation. You want to do that veto one, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, on the core core tasks and and evolution, uh, I mean, we're not likely to see much revolution uh, in those uh, terms. Uh, we are looking forward to um, emphasizing the key role of, of collective defense, and this is likely to to happen. However, the alliance is going to retain the the whole breadth of its uh, of of its tasks and missions, and I think it's a good message because we want the alliance that will be relevant to all of its uh, allies. And when it comes to the terrorism, I think it's th this is the, the area of crisis uh, management. Um, I, I th there's one important lesson from Afghanistan that we, as Poland, try to, to project. I mean, we, we need to be realistic when it comes to our engagements um, out of area. They have to be relevant to, our, to the security of the AOR. Um, and area of responsibility. Area of responsibility. Uh, yes, sorry for 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 just uh, projecting the jargon. And um, um, 
also, we need to recognize that crisis management is not just terrorism. I mean, and, I mean, and it's actually been coined, I think, around the area of the cri Cuban crisis. And what we actually are dealing with in, in Ukraine is a crisis management as well. The alliance is managing the crisis. So we need to retain the whole breadth of uh, instruments with the emphasis on collective defense. And I uh, pass over to you. The veto. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't see really any uh, d uh, drive uh, at the moment to change um, the alliance's core operating principle, and that is to, to build consensus uh, at 30. Um, the good news on that front is we have 73 years of experience of working through our differences, and as I said, we, we grapple with differences all the time. I think I'd be astounded if I ever went into a NAC session and we all said exactly the same thing. That's what the alliance is all about. So um, I, I maybe sometime in the future, I, I don't know, but right now, actually, that's not really part of, of the conversation. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I think we all feel like we have the skills we need to deal with any set of circumstances when a hand goes up in the back of the room and says, we, we fundamentally disagree. And obviously, we're coping with that uh, right now on the question of Finland and Sweden, but I'm entirely confident that we'll work through it. And probably two final questions from the first row and Ambassador Fried later on. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Steve Erlanger, New York Times. I also want to ask about Turkey, needless to say, and perhaps uh, Mr. Shotkovsky could answer first. Um, Erdogan has done this before at NATO. He did it with Rasmussen in 2009. Is this something, and, and it, it, it is worth saying with every day, his no gets louder, it doesn't get softer. I mean, in the beginning, he didn't say he would veto. Now he said yesterday that he would. No, maybe he won't. But the question is, is this something NATO is capable of handling, or does it end up becoming a Biden-Erdogan debate over F-35s and Patriots? I mean, is it about Sweden and the PKK at all? Or do you think it's about something else? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, we are, uh, I, I th you know, our Turkish ally is known to, for being tough negotiator and we kind of appreciate that and we've got kind of used to, to that. They have a feeling that not the entire um, breadth of the security concerns are being recognized sometimes by, by, by all the allies. Sometimes this is legitimate, sometimes, sometimes this is not a legitimate uh, concern on their on their side, but we need to make sure that 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 we underscore that we are with Turkey also with, with their like leg legitimate concern. Um, I don't want to go into details of, of of because I mean also for the you know uh, g good p in having my positive prospect of 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 the solution. As as Julie has said, I'm also confident that eventually, like has always been the case in the past, constructivity will 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 uh, prevail and uh, again I think Secretary General has offered his um, services when it comes to facilitating dialogue and I think he's a he will be in a very good position to to, to try to help that solve that issue and, and clarify and and we believe that it's actually the time for solving such issues is, is the accession, accession process and we hope this is going to be to be the case and Ambassador Fried uh, okay. Oh, so. uh, well, I guess uh, the only thing I would add is they've raised concerns. The concerns they have are tied directly to Sweden and Finland, and so we're encouraging them to work with those two countries and come to a table together or perhaps on a, on a phone call and work it out. Um, they did not raise issues with other allies, and so we will leave it to Sweden, Finland, and Turkey to keep working through this. We'll continue to sit at the table and offer any assistance in that regard, but this appears to be an issue that they have with Sweden and Finland, so we'll leave it in their hands. We have only one minute left. Some, Mr. Ambassador, please. Um, Madam Ambassador, that was a strong statement at the beginning, that the U.S. seeks a strategic defeat for Russia in Ukraine.
Now, I don't know whether you intended that to be stronger than strategic failure. To me, it sounds a little stronger. But in any event, it doesn't seem as if the US government is tempted to follow the advice of the New York Times editorial board and start pressuring Ukraine to surrender territory, or the advice of our friend Charlie Kupchin, or even the advice of the Italian prime minister who called for an immediate ceasefire in place. So where does, with all these calls, and I remember the New York Times, they didn't want Poland and NATO at all back in my, you know, the 90s. With all these calls for an immediate ceasefire, presumably in place, with Putin in possession of additional territories gained through aggression, where's the US on this issue of supporting Ukraine in the war versus a ceasefire, the party of peace versus the party of justice? Well, we fundamentally want to allow Ukraine to decide for itself how it wants to end this war. If it wants to go sit at the negotiating table as Ukrainians did early on with Russian counterparts when the war began, we were supportive of that. We didn't feel compelled to tell anyone how to manage that. We were concerned that Russia wasn't negotiating in good faith, and alas, I think that turned out to be the case. Um, but ultimately, this rests with them, and if they decide that they need more support, and that is the signal we're getting from them right now, humanitarian, economic, and security assistance, we stand prepared to continue to provide that. And I think, honestly, it's as simple as that. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our fantastic guests. Thank you. It was a real pleasure, privilege to have you here. Thank you.